Hi everybody, welcome to my 11th torsional bar video. In this video I'm going to be solving this statistically indeterminate torsional bar problem and I'm going to be finding and plotting the internal torque and twist. If you want to see another example of a statistically indeterminate torsional bar or you want to know something else about torsional bars, feel free to check out any of my other videos. So the first thing I want to point out in this situation where we have st statistical indeterminacy is that we're going to need to compare it once again to an axial bar situation. So I'm assuming that because you're watching this torsional bar video you've already done axial bars and you've already solved statistically indeterminate axial bars. So we're going to apply the same principle here. So back to the definition of being statistically indeterminate basically just means you don't have enough information from looking at sum of forces and sum of moments basically equilibrium conditions to solve for the reactions or the internal forces. So we need to go another route and we need to look at the displacement and that's going to tell us what these reactions and the internal torques in this case are going to be. So like always if we need to plot internal things, in this case internal torque, we're going to need to make cuts to expose those internal torques. And we're going to make three cuts in this scenario. One there, one there, one there. Simply because between the support right here and this force can be all described by the same situation. Between this torque and this torque, it's pretty well all the same. And between here and the end, it's all going to be the same. All right, there's nothing changing in those pieces. So the way that we look, this is kind of important doing the statistically indeterminate bar problem when it's stuck in between two walls. So my method is to only look in one direction. So this way, when we make our cuts and go through, we're going to find all the internal torques in terms of the reaction at the one support. Okay. Now you could look both ways, but then you're going to have your internal reactions in terms of this support and that support, and you'll need another equation, an overall equation, to relate this reaction and this reaction. So you'll need to go through another whole equation and then sub it back in and go through a bunch of further steps. But if you just discipline yourself to look the one way, this last one, and you get further over, it might be a little bit trickier, but it'll make your life easier in the long run. So let's go ahead and call, name these sections. We'll call this section here 1, this section here 2, this section here 3. So let's get a free body diagram of cut 1. Alright, there we go. So quite simply, sum of the torques in the x direction to be 0, and we can say T1 equal to R1. Okay, so we don't know what any of these are, but we know that they equal each other. Alright, moving along, let's do a free body diagram of this piece, or section 2. Okay, so the same thing applies here. We sum up the torques in the x direction to be 0. So that's basically T2 minus T minus R1 equals 0. Or just like that. All right, so free body diagram 1, 2. Now let's do free body diagram 3, this whole piece including those two torques. Alright, and just like before, we're going to sum up the torques in the x. Okay. 
And there you have it. All right, this is the description of the internal torques in terms of just one reaction. Now, because it's statistically indeterminate, we need to look at another condition. And in axial bars, that was displacement. We said the total displacement between this point and this point is zero. Well, now that we're in the torsional bar world, we're going to look at the torsional bar equivalent of displacement, and that is twist. All right, so since the bar is fixed at the wall, its amount of displacement in the twist is going to be nothing. It shouldn't be twisting when it's attached to the fixed wall, neither here nor there. All right, in between it can be doing whatever it wants, but it has to start at zero, do its thing, and then come back to zero. So we can say that the sum of all the displacements between x equals zero, where I start to measure x from the very base here, between x equals zero and x equals l, because the full length here is l, has to be zero. All right. So if the sum of all the displacements in between here and here is zero, I can say that the sum of the displacements broken down like this also must be zero. Okay, so mathematically these are the same terms. If you see these pieces of the integral are the same. So this is a mathematically equ equivalent statement to this. All right, and that's what we want. We want the math to be consistent. Now why did I break it down to these limits? Well, if you look here, starting x to be zero, having these all x, all right, so they can call this x. Those are just the total distances of each of these three pieces, okay? And that helps us a lot, all right? It's not just arbitrary that I chose those. It's, I chose those for a very specific reason because each of those displacements can be described by this equation. All right, the amount of displacement in this piece here can be described by the, you know, the properties of that piece, which is the internal torque, G and J. And then, of course, the next little bit of twist can be described by the properties of that piece. So its own T, G, and J, and of course, the same logic for the third one. And in our case, we know each one is gonna be different. So that's why I specifically broke them up into the sections that we decided to call one, two, and three. So now I'm gonna take this and sub it into here for each, you know, respective value. So this would be section three. So each one of these is gonna be, have a little three behind it to denote that in this section, we have those properties. Right, there you have it. And this is a mathematically equivalent statement, and this allows us to calculate the displacement at you know any point along the bar, provided we know all these variables. All right now, we just know from here what all our t's are in terms of the reaction. So if we would plug all these t's into this equation, we'd only have one unknown, and that would be that reaction. So plugging all these in and solving would give us r. And once we knew R, we could come back and find all the internal torques. And we could plot them. Once we knew all the internal torques, we can go to this equation, and now that we know everything about this equation, we can actually find what that displacement is. Okay? So this is the, the key step of this equation here. And it makes life easy, as you can see now, because we only have one unknown all of these, that's the reaction, so we can just find the reaction. We don't have to do an overall equilibrium equation to you know go black and you know take the overall equilibrium equation, plug it into our you know these T's and then sort it out over here. No, just always look to the one side and then this will make your life a lot easier when you get to here. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug T1 into here, you know, T2 into here, T3 into here, and then I'm gonna collect the like terms 
and solve for the reaction. And also what I'm going to do is then I'm going to immediately integrate this and evaluate it. Alright, because we can see here that T1 is constant. It doesn't depend on X. Likewise with T2, likewise with T3. So we don't technically need these integral signs. I'm just including them to be complete. Another thing you're going to want to notice is that G and J are the same in all situations. And if we would factor out a G and a GJ, 1 over GJ, out of all these integrals, and then multiply it off, it would disappear because of the zero. So we can effectively get rid of these. So let's go through. All right, and there you have it, the reaction at the support. Okay, now we can go back, take this reaction, plug it into all of our T equations and find out what those T's actually are. So just simply plugging this into here, we know that. Right, and there you have it. That's the internal torque. Okay, now we're required to plot this, so let's just go ahead and plot this. All right, and there you have it. That's the internal distribution of the torques. All right, now, in order to find the displacement or the twist, we simply take these torques and plug them into this equation here. Since we now know what the torques are, and we can solve it overall. I'll go ahead and do that in one step here.
Alright, so simply what I've done is I've plugged in the reactions. Alright, so I basically plugged in T1, T2, T3, their length, that's the DX term here, and then GJ. Now, of course, it counts. Okay, and simplifying this, you can write Alright, and this gives us the formula for the overall displacement. Because as we recall, we broke down the displacement into three sections, you know, from 0 to 3L by 2, so from here to here, and then the displacement in the next piece here, was from here to here, and the displacement is from here to here. And overall, because the walls are fixed, it must be 0. So let's just check. Did we do our math right? You know, negative 9 minus 3, negative 12 plus 12, bingo, that all equals 0. So we did it right, alright, thumbs up. That's the way to check now. To plot the displacement, we need to know displacement at certain points. So a displacement at point 1, that's just going to be this piece here. A displacement at point 2 is going to be that piece, displacement at 1, plus a further displacement. All right, So we can call it like P2 and this P1. Okay, and we can find that to be P1, so the twist at 1, we can find the twist at 1 because we know all the properties in that piece, is going to be and then phi 2 is simply phi 1 plus this piece, so we're basically summing up all the twists until we reach a certain point, which is usually arbitrary, but in this case we've decided to be at this point, so we're summing up all the twists stop here, how much twist have we got? And it turns out to be alright, and of course we can simplify that a little bit, but I'm going to leave it that way, it makes it easier to graph. Alright, let's go ahead and graph this displacement then. All right, and there you have it. Now, I just want to make a contrast, or not really a contrast, a comparison between, all right, this graph here. All right, so since we integrated t to find phi, we should expect a relationship. So here, it's a great negative value, so we should expect a great negative slope. That's what we have. Here, it's negative, but it's of a less value, so we should expect a less negative slope. Exactly what we have. Here, it's positive of actually the same magnitude of slope of this, alright, so just in the opposite direction, that's exactly what we have. Alright, so that brings us to the end of this question, I hope that helped you out, and we'll see you in my next Torsional Bar video.